It's Rog. It's Thursday night, the real March Madness. Yeah, CONCACAF Nations League Soccer semi-finals, baby. And US Soccer. I ate for them. The women had to play during the Oscars. The men play on opening night of March Madness college basketball. And tonight, honestly, it was probably for the best uh, that the nation's eyes were like, you know, elsewhere. Um, this was a night of, what did we watch? Shock, uh, of, of horror, um, of occasional magical last second redemption. Hadji Wright is a great American. Gio Reyna is a great American. This was the night that the team I love, the United States, played eerily like my other ride or die Everton Football Club. <sighs> And it was not pretty. And I don't know about you. I'm still in some kind of shock. I'm trying to process it. This, the best squad of individuals we've ever been able to draw upon in our nation's history. Um, and we're forced to truly fight for their lives tonight by a woefully shorthanded Jamaica. And we survived and advanced to quote the great late Jim Valvano. But man, for a long time, Tonight, all that talk of, of three-peat just felt like it was stuck like ashes in our mouth. So let's process this together. Let's try and process how. How? how? Yeah, when Iceland beat England in the Euros 2016, I couldn't believe it. You know, when Colbyn Sigurdsson scored what turned out to be the winner on 18 minutes. Watching England toil, it was impossible to fathom. How could they not score these giants? How could they not do this? Tonight felt like long stretches, very much like that. With Heimer Halmagrasson, the Icelandic manager, now leading Jamaica again. How can all these talents have 89 minutes, 30 seconds to score? And only do that at the very last. Let's process this together. Uh, you can join me, dear listeners. Uh, you can ask us questions about the real March Madness. Come on up. Tell us what we've just seen. Ask your hardest questions together. Here's how. Just scan the QR code top left of your screen take you into a zoom with our producer um jake who'll get you set up to come on and ask your question come on up it's audio only so you don't even need to put your shirt back on uh, just help us click on the old uh like get stuck in in the chat we'll bang the best comments up on screen um but before we begin and talk about this game i did want to raise a third for first michelob ultra of the night to something which is really important in football the memory um, of former panama striker luis matador tejada the gent who helped the national team qualify for its first ever world cup in 2018 passed away in january aged just 41. panama's all-time leading goal scorer claps while playing in a local rec league um this is tonight just kicking off the first game for the canaleros since his passing gent honestly synonymous um, with football in their nation. And I want to raise a glass uh, to his legacy, to his memory tonight. Ultimately, that is real life and death. Um, but to the game tonight, which just felt like it. The United States 3, Jamaica 1 after extra time. Um, I predicted a 3-1 win in our preview. I said it would be a 3-1 win that sounds like a comfortable win, but will be anything uh, but... Um, and that's exactly what it turned out to be. The U.S. men came into Texas after back-to-back -back losses. This was the stakes. We'd lost to Trinidad and Tobago, and then the B team uh, had lost to Slovenia. Um, and really, I, I, I don't know about you, but I was just like, God, I would bite your arm off for a deeply unsatisfying victory tonight. We needed a win. Uh, this deep U.S. squad, deepest U.S. squad, individual for individual, that we have ever been able to call upon so much bloody talent. Um, and yes, we were without um, Sergio Dest out with self-inflicted emoliation cause red cards. Um, Tyler Adams um, injured, God bless. Um, not able to start, but lovely to see him back leading this team um, from the sideline. Uh, but apart from that, you know, um, Geo not selected because of lack of game time. Miles Robinson chosen over old man Tim Ream. But this th this was a strong, bloody US team. We were facing a Jamaica who, yes, they've beaten Canada in the last round, but they have really 
fallen apart uh, since. This was not the Jamaica of our recent resurgent imagination. It's almost a random scattering of Jamaicans, 11. Suspensions, injuries, behavioural issues. Um, speed wonder Leon Bailey of Aston Villa left out for this squad for disciplinary reasons after he broke a curfew at the last camp and then did a, a kind of like, you can't fire me, I'm going to quit anyway. Um, uh, just accusing the Federation for, I mean, there's truth in this, complete woeful lack of professionalism across that Jamaican Federation. Um, massive loss there. Mikel Antonio, late scratch due to injury. Um, Ethan Pinnock injured at the back. Trevante Stewart dropped for breaking curfew. Uh, Damari Gray and Shamar Nicholson, their attackers suspended following second yellow cards um, back in November. Uh, we had manager... Jaime Halmagrasson on our podcast today. Worth listening to, even after the game now, uh, because he described, I think, as diplomatically as possible, um, a Jamaican federation that is a total, complete and utter crap show. Just disorganised, chaos, no infrastructure, no plan, no vision, no staff. Um, that's who we played against. They listened to him in that. And he just seemed so defeated. Uh, before kickoff, and I wondered as I listened to him, I did. I wondered whether is there an element of rope a dope in this, lulling us into a false sense of security. Um, but the players he could call upon, mostly League One and Championship, in the majority. Truth was, a full Jamaican team would have made this a March Madness five versus twelve seed clash. But because of just the vast absences for Jamaica, this game before kickoff, it felt like a US two against a Jamaican 15. And there was so much that was astonishing at the outset of the game. I do need to mention this. This pains me. At kickoff, this United States game at AT&T, one of the great temples of sports in our nation. Capacity, what is it? 80,000. Practically no one there for the game. Desolate. Um, it's just an empty, cavernous stadium. All the tickets snapped up seemingly by Mexican fans for the second game in the doubleheader, which is, which is honestly... Heartbreaking. There were more fans at the US Open Cup Vermont Green game tonight than there were at kickoff watching the best football team on the men's side uh, that we could ever draw upon as individuals. And within 30 seconds, this game went full on March Madness bracket buster. The quickest goal scored against the US this century, which sounds amazing. Then you realize we're only in 2024. But I mean, off a Jamaican throw in too. Jamaica stole the initiative, like Shohei Otani's translator. I was kind of glad no one was watching 30 seconds in. The entire US backline asleep. No one looks good. Anthony Robinson pants by his Fulham teammate Bobby De Cordova Reed, lobbed the ball back post. Joe Scally. By the way, Joe Scally seems to have given himself a haircut like Keith in the Righteous Gemstones. Was it inflicted upon him? Did he choose it? I don't know. Whatever, he lost his man, Gregory Lee, a left-back journeyman. Plays for Oxford United in League One. And Gregory Lee just rose up like a snapper oh, on a great Jamaican river to head hard and true. And the ball just thrashed home. I've got to say this off Matt Turner's despairing wrist. A confident Matt Turner probably would have done more with that. Um, I don't like to be knee-jerk, but the only rational response 30 seconds into this game uh, was to just scream, to my dog. Our new kits are cursed! I mean, March Madness. This was March bloody sadness. Um, Gregory Lee, what a moment. That name, now in the Jamaican pantheon of greats, alongside Bob Marley, Harry Belafonte, Usain Bolt, Grace Jones, and of course, Shaggy. Um, and I don't know about you, but in that moment, it felt very, very bleak. Um, I've been looking forward to this game all week to see our boys play and we didn't even get 31 seconds it's all i asked for 31 seconds of hope uh, of delight and on our previous show hurt gomez he had said the goal for the united states was to avoid catastrophe so i texted her i was like how do you define catastrophe um and Hurt kind of answered with that old sporting aphorism that everybody has a plan until they get scored on by Jamaica after 31 seconds. But my God, you know, I reminded myself just like you can't make a tomlet or get out of a Copa group without breaking some Gregs. That was where we were. This Greg game plan um, was up in the air that quickly in. How would the US respond? But I would have commentated gobsmacked. He screamed, hush has fallen over this stadium, which I just loved. I mean, um, this was an empty stadium. 
it wasn't that dramatic. But the question was, how would the United States rebound? How would we react to this moment? The honest truth was, we were rattled. We tried to play at tempo, uh, back to front football at speed, but uncalibrated. A lot of sloppy efforts to move that ball forward at space. A lot of self-defeating moves. Um, a lot of balls just given away. A lot of second balls lost, mostly down the right. Um, we tried to get there, you know, Scally often in acres of space, Balogun, our gen, the prince who was promised, just five goals on the season, a hard season at Monaco, toiling. Christian Pulisic open for a moment on the break, failed to get a shot off, took that extra touch. Tillman tried to get swaggy um, when he was on the ball, but the honest truth was we looked unsure, we looked unclinical in transition, uh, the decision-making was erratic and Jamaica started to flicker ever more confidently on counter after counter. Um, we were frenzied. We were headless in comparison to Jamaica. Um, and again, I said, what would Greg's tactics be in this moment? Um, I felt for him uh, on one level, almost from the very opening whistle, whatever game plan he had ripped up. Um, suddenly had to, his worst nightmare, break down a compact, organized, tenacious Jamaican defense. What was it the first half? 81% possession for the US, just one shot on goal. And I looked at that, I was like, that's how the Grissom ball. Hey, Mayer, learn to do this kind of, um, you know, just this deeply decisive, organized uh, planning with Iceland at their peak, that win against England, racing through the Euros 2016, the 2018 World Cup qualification, which I think he took even more pride in um, to get out of that group in the style he did. Um, but talking about the World Cup, and we'll get to this. We are two years out from the 2026 World Cup. That's what I'm watching this in split screens, the US performances, the now, and then projecting it forward. You know, we have this showcase. It's about to descend. Um, this moment of wonder for the game in this nation. And this was, this was tough. The grass looked terrible. Um, unevenly sodded, so self-inflicted conquer cafe, a howled at the moon. Um, why? Why are we not playing this game of football that is important to us in proper conditions? You know what I mean by that. Why are we not playing every single game for the rest of time in Minnesota in two degrees Fahrenheit with a wind chill of 16 degrees below zero? That that's proper football. Second half, though, we went even more attacking. Scally yanked, replaced by his good friend, Gio Reyna, came on. What did he have, like, is it 39 minutes scattered into? I mean, ever more rare substitute appearances since his move to Nottingham Forest. Um, so much to prove to himself, to Burhalter, to the American fan base. And just a realisation that he had a chance to play in this game more minutes for the US than he's played for Forest in 2024. I mean, that's hard to get your head around. He came on, um, Weston went to right back, Geo started to probe, provide subtle stealth craft, Guile slipping in Tillman, Jamaica dropping back ever deeper, deeper into an ever more defensive crouch. Um, I said in my preview show that what we needed to see in this game was a coherent idea of the kind of football Greg wants us to play. But this, this was frenzy. This was just all hands on deck. Um, this was Pooley trying to lift the team onto his shoulders, playing like the professor from the Anwar mixtape tour. Um, why do we always do this to ourselves? Um, you know, how are you feeling? What questions have you got? Because, I mean, watching that clock tick away in the second half, I was like, oh my God, this Do It Live is going to be like some kind of Kate Spiracy session, just levels of confusion here. Um, Greg just smashing emergency glass with each of his changes. Ricardo Pepe flung on yet again. Go on, lad. Go and save the entire nation. Uh, Balogun off. Uh, Gent still seems a bit lost in our system. Um, had you right, the player of the moment, the hot hand, came on for an out-of-sorts wear. And Tyler Adams uh, back on in a US jersey. I love seeing that man. Um, after four 174, let me say that number again, 474 days out um, with injury, ham double hamstring operations, two of them become a dad since he last played for the United States, just 20 minutes of Bournemouth league play under his belt. God, it was good to see him. And I was just looking all over the field. Who is the US player calming things? It was Tyler. Who was saying, don't worry, we got this. Look at us, look at us, look at us. We got this. Um, it was it was Tyler. Um, but it was frantic. It was scratchy. It was fearful football at times. Um, Jamaica seemed to honestly draw strength from our vulnerability. I've got to credit them. 
We really do. This depleted squad. I mean, morale could not have been great when this squad united. Um, not just the players missing. Can you imagine Pulisic, Ballo, Weir, Weston, Tyler not playing for us? That's what the uh, Jamaican, the equivalent that they lacked. But also, you know, taking shots at the entire program. You turn up in that to play the United States in Dallas. Could have felt great. Um, and what was it in that uh, second half? 17, 18 shots for the United States. I think three at most are on target. Can't think of a save Andre Blake had to make. Before the denouement, I mean, that was that that that's the, the the thing that we've got to remember about tonight, even as we celebrate everything that is to come. Because into the 90th, we felt bereft watching something that we love tumble into the abyss. Yes, it's just the Nations League. It is. It is just the Nations League. I kept telling myself, um, but still this couldn't be. It made no sense. It was a darkness. 90 minutes plus six. <sighs> Up comes Matt Turner. The ball floated in. Um, Miles Robinson, flick on. I think off the head of Corey Burke, the Red Bull player, the Jamaican. Um, I felt for them in that second. I did. That was my reaction. I don't know about you. I wasn't like, yes. I was more like, oh, my God. I actually ate for them. They've been so outstanding, so bloody close. Barely time for another kick. Um, but we were alive. We roared. Uh, just barely alive. A, a whistler at the death. Um, an own goal, Fergie time, no, Greg time, yes, bloody hell, I screamed, our new set coach, uh, his new set piece coach, Johnny Vio, is a genius, just as he drew it up, conjuring own goals, that was always the plan, right, Johnny, um, a Mexican-American friend of mine texted me, ha, 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 Greg has horseshoes up his ass, I mean, equalising goal, 95 minutes, 24 seconds, the latest stoppage time goal for the US, since Ricardo Clark uh, in Venezuela, um, January 2012. This is the territory we were in, into extra time. Um, Jamaica gassed. They had nothing. Uh, but to hold on, uh, penalties, that was really their option. And the U.S. suddenly started playing like we wanted them to from the outset. Pulisic surging forward, dispossessed. The ball fell to the feet of Gio Reyna. This kid, he's still a kid. He's 21 years old, and he just skipped one way. And then slipped a disguise past the other. Are you watching Nottingham Forest? And he freed whom? Hadji bloody right. Who shimmy to create space and then just thrash the ball home with a plob. Can I just say, can we just think about this? Hadji right. Being Hadji right. I can't imagine this gent. I'm so glad for Hadji. You look at his arc. You look at his season. You look at his last weekend. This 25-year-old from Los Angeles. I mean, a 25-year-old who'd become a scapegoat. I talked about this in the preview for our World Cup. Greg's, you know, decision at last. Pepe, not you. You're not coming. You're not coming to the World Cup. Yes, you've scored the goals that got us here, but I'm dumping you. I'm going to bring this guy, Hadji. And then the US didn't score, couldn't conjure goals. Um, it felt like this was not Hadji's fault, but he felt, I would imagine, to him. I'd love to get him on the show. Um, I felt like to him, he went back to club football um, feeling a bit bruised by the experience. And what did he do? He doubled down, became the top scorer for his Premier League dreaming side, Coventry, 15 goals on the season. Didn't initially make the squad, the US squad. That wasn't enough to make it. Then went and scored a 90 plus 10 minute wonder goal to send this time side to a Wembley FA Cup semi final. And then found out post game in the locker room on the phone from his agent. They had to go right to the airport, right to Heathrow, fly to join the United States squad after all. And then after delivering for his club and become an icon forever in Coventry law. Now he had this, this moment, a massive moment when his nation needed him. We needed him. This man. After 90 minutes, he's money. He is money. Had she right, only buzzer beaters. And it's magnificent to witness. Humanly magnificent. Relief. Had she scored an emphatic third. By the way, I love how humble he is when he scores. Again, another exquisite G Arena pass by Sexy. Was it three defenders? Sexy, sexy football. That must have felt so good for him. G Arena tonight bailed out the United States. G Arena tonight bailed out Greg Berhalter. Um, and by the way, why do we watch football if not for Greek epic drama level narrative? That's what we got tonight for Gio Reyna. And I do salute him 
had she right to became the first player to score multiple goals as a substitute in a knockout game in our nation's history. Honestly, George Washington never. Had she right? Yes. Remember, up top I said, coming into this game, all I asked for was a deeply and satisfying victory. It's exactly what we got. Albeit one with a heroic cameo from G. Rayner and H. Wright that made it all seem coated with a layer of honey feel-good sweetness. J. Kuki in the chat says, Todd Burley just put in a £200 million bid for Hadji Wright. You won't get him for 200 mil. Got to go up there, Todd. Go up, bid higher. Uh, two quick final points before we take your questions. Um, first, and I can't wait for them. I'd love to know how you're feeling. First, we've got to raise a glass to Jamaica. Um, some game plan, some organisation, spirit, force, togetherness, um, a loss, but in many ways a victory. Um, listen, if you've not listened to today's podcast, in it I interviewed the Jamaican manager, Hamer Hamagrasson, my friend, I love him. You will remember him, I think, the Icelandic dentist who led tiny Iceland to the 2018 FIFA World Cup. He taught us that word. If you were watching Men in Blazers back then, we talked about it a lot. Icelandic word, Dugladur. I'm mispronouncing it horribly. I apologize, Icelandic fans. Dugladur, it, it's not translatable. They, everyone kept telling me it's not translatable. It is translatable. It's tenacity. And that's what Jamaica played with tonight. Jamaica have beaten us twice on American soil only. They came with a depleted squad, with a collective ferocity, with a steal. They made us sweat. They made us struggle. They made us shake. They came close. And I'll just say, if I owned an MLS team, I would hire Hamir as my coach in a second. Name me another manager who can do more with less, as he proved tonight. And for the US, we live. We live. Just, you know, history will forget just how close we came to true humiliation. Let's be candid. Um, if we win the Nations League three P on Sunday. But this is the reality. Nations League, Schmations League. If we lost tonight, I would have said the same. If we win it, I say the same. It's nice to win things. But the real goal is that we are two years out from the biggest event ever to happen in our nation sports wise. Um, and even with the heat of 100 Super Bowls, um, we need to prepare like we've never prepared before. It's going to change the profile of the game if we get our decisions right. Uh, the game we love can be forever changed in the nation we adore. I'll just say we're still in need of a defining performance. And Sunday, please God, we get another chance to, to summon that one, to deliver one. Um, all of you in the chat that completed our poll, how are you feeling about this win? 56% of you said annoyed. I love an annoyed win. Oh, I won. God damn it. Um, there's another poll in the chat. Do you trust Greg? Well, the good news is 6% of you said yes. I'm, I'm trying to be an optimist here. Was it 6% that said yes or was there another option other than the 94% of you that said the opposite? Um, what's now the winner of tonight? The United States will rumble on to face the victory of the other semi-final that's going on right now between Mexico and a very tidy Panama. Bring it on. Churchill always said the greatest thrill in life, the greatest emotion is to be shot at without result. And that's what happened to the United States men tonight. Copa is looming. I think we're 91 days away. Greg's post-match press conference has not been posted yet. Be riveting to see how, how he saw this game, how he coped. What he learnt, uh, if it happens while we are doing it live with you, we'll, we'll uh, break in and, and tell you the highlights. But to your questions, a reminder um, of how this works. Come up, come be with me on YouTube Live. You just have to scan the QR code top left or click the pinned comment in the chat. That will take you right into our producer who will get you on to talk with me. Smash the like button. Keep going in that chat. But let's start with... Oh, the great Chris Ferris. Come on up, baby. Tell us where you are, what you're feeling tonight. Chris Ferris. Hello, gorgeous. We're going to go to the next caller. Chris, if you're there, hang on. But come on up, mighty Matt. Hello? Hi. Is that Matt hey, or this Chris? Is Chris Ferris. Chris Ferris this is Chris gorgeous, from Houston. Man. Where are you, Chris? I'm coming from Houston, Texas. 
Oh, mate, you are in God's country. Could you hear the screams all the way in Houston when Hadji did the biz no, there, tonight? There were no screams. It was all Mexican fans. <laughs> Oh my God, is that is an agony uh, and the truth in its own right. Chris, tell us what you're feeling. Tell us what your question is, you beautiful human being. So Raj, I'm delighted to be on. I've been a fan of Men and Blazers for years. I actually started reading Michael Davies when he was on page two during the 20, 2002 World Cup. So that's how long I go back with the Men and Blazers. You must have been a hothouse child, Chris. You sound still <laughs> like a baby. Um, how are you feeling, gorgeous? I'm ambiguous, ambivalent, because on the one hand, we have such talented players, and yet I feel like they, he, Bohar also mean, manages to get the absolute least out of them just about every single time. So part of me, and I feel, and I feel ashamed to say this, I kind of want them to lose. And I, I, I've been a U.S. fan since I was a kid back in, in the 80s, um, you know, before they even made the World Cup. And... I don't know what to do about this because I want them to win. I want them to play well. I want to get the most out of these players, but I feel like the coach is the absolutely wrong guy to do it. And I was hoping they weren't going to win. And I felt kind of ashamed that they won the way they did against a completely game and brave Jamaica team. So I'm just very conflicted about the whole thing, Raj. Yeah, this is, this is a tough one. This is a, this is a tough one, Chris Ferris. It's a surreal one. Um, it's a, I mean, it's a grueling reality. I, this was one that we had in the run-up I mean, until Pepe bailed out the last cycle. I mean, we've kind of airbrushed out of history. Uh, you know, when we judge the last cycle, ultimately we judge it by the culmination that night uh, against the Netherlands where the United States were gassed. Um, you know, Louis van Gaal um, kind of, they were, you know, in the Louis van Gaal style, just laughed at the, the tactical naivete of, of the UST. That's how we remember the last cycle. But in that last cycle, there was that rocky patch, which Pepe bailed us out of when I was. We... Yeah, I was at the game in Austin where he scored two, I think, against Jamaica. And yes, and Chris, I'm sure then you were in that same mode. The fair, I mean, the, the, the almost rooting against the team because you love it so to root to see. So this is not, I'm imagining the first time that Chris Ferris has been. I mean, it's a horrible thing. It's a horrible moment. And the reality is also that, um, I mean, the true darkness and the true surreal reality is, listen, US soccer saw something in um greg we still don't truly understand what it is um you know we had a lot of talk about the data um that uh, that matt crocker had used and it led just emphatically towards greg that's never truly been you know we've not seen the data we don't truly understand it um you know i've spoken to some other coaches who were in the mix uh I'd say, all i can say is they are somewhat confused by it all we do know that the players, you know, attest to publicly to love him, which is both a, that's a complicated thing, you know, um, not to go all, was it this boy's life where it was like, what, is it better to be loved or feared? Like managers who yeah. are loved, that's not always a great thing. Um, but that's a conversation for another day. But there is a reason Greg was hired again. Uh, it's got to be a reason on the field. And I just say, we, we are not seeing that. We're not seeing that idea of football that coherent idea of football that the kind of football that makes us sing that makes us say yes this progression this joy um this wonder but the the, the wild thing chris is and this is this is hard to fathom i've never seen it in football before in the premier league um they talk about um you know a manager has to go um when he's lost the fans um, you know, you hear, but Jesse Marsh was an example at Leeds that they, they said, We've got to, you know, we want to keep Jesse, but we've got to let him go. Chelsea, um, you know, they're, they're very attuned to their fans, particularly at the moment. Um, and they, um, you know, they will fire a manager when the, the faithful chant against him. The odd thing about this reality, Chris, and you're it sounds like you are in there as a lifetime devotee of the U.S. Men's National Team. Greg had lost the fans before he was appointed a second time, and I've never seen this odd reality before. Um, whether, you know, you, you, you fire a manager when they've lost the fans. He was appointed having lost the fans, and that's where we are. There's an inversion of an inversion, which comes to 
a, this odd moment where Chris Ferris, who's seen this team, gone in person, loves this team, is rooting against them. I find that very painful, Chris. Yeah, it's painful for me too. I was I was sitting here on the couch with my wife and I was just sort of had my head in my hands and then we scored and I just sort of laughed this like a like a like an insane person. Like I can't believe we scored and I can't believe I'm not excited about it. Um so it's um <clears throat> it's just uh it's a hard time to be a fan and that's a pity because the World Cup is two years away, as you mentioned a few minutes ago. And I just I, I don't want us to fall on our face in the world, you know, the World Cup next year. And that's I mean, if we can't beat a ramshackle, ragged B team from Jamaica <laughs> at home in Dallas, what are we going to do next? In, you know, in two years against the Netherlands again, or oh. or in Japan? I mean, who knows? I just, I, have, I, have, I Chris, fear. The, the whack thing about little, this dreading... comeback, and I love you, um, is we did beat them. We did beat them. We're both talking about them as if tonight we're morning, and that is like these I know are, these are the complicated realities. You know, we often. Um, as an Everton fan, I will celebrate. And under David Moyes, there were many losses that felt like wins. Um, we seem to be world champions at wins that feel like losses. Here we are. God bless. Chris, come on on Sunday after the game. And if we lift the trophy, come back and tell me how you feel. We're going to be doing it live with Brendan Hunt. Um, and we can all try and detangle these deeply complex and intertwined human emotions together. You're a beautiful human being to better days ahead. Next up, it's Mighty Matt. Are you there, Matt? I'm you and come and be with us, beautiful. Hey, Raj, can you hear me? Matt, the world can hear you, baby. Tell us where you are and what's your question. Well, I'm in Roanoke, Virginia, actually. Um, I have to agree with Chris with a lot he said, but do you feel like these players have outgrown the manager? Like they're, they're better than what he's offering? And, man, I just feel like this is not working. The The chaos of the summer and everything that went down is indescribable. And the federation that went through with this rehiring, I don't know, man. I feel like these guys need a professional manager because they're better players than what we saw tonight. It was just, I mean, they're kicking balls out of bounds. It looks like they've never played together. It's just embarrassing. Um, so I I will, I, I'll, I'll tell I you know, this. I know it's, I know it was just a, a tiny game tonight, but it was, I mean, they just look awful. So let me tell you this. Here's the good news. You do not need to be a good manager to be the, to be a good manager of an international team. You just don't. This is the this is another complicated reality. Let me throw out a name for you, Walid Regragru, um, and I apologise if I pronounce it badly. Uh, Producer J Dubs is on a flight to Manchester to go and film with with Sam Mewis for the Manchester derby, and he's the kind of guy that keeps me on the straight with my Moroccan pronunciations. He's the Moroccan coach from the last World Cup. He's a good coach. He's not a great coach. He's not a tactical genius. The football they played was not tactically complex, buccaneering. Um, ultimately, you can be a good international coach with spirit. Um, you know, just bring in the best out of the collective. We we've seen it. We've seen it often. Uh, you know, Costa Rica in 2014 had a great run. They weren't great footballers. They just had true spirit. They seized the moment. Um, Look, why do the players like Greg? There's, ma there's many reasons. You, you'll have to ask them. Um, but you could say that um, one reason is a lot of the players were struggling in the last cycle. Pulisic, this is a happy place. The US, This is the strength of the US team. It's a haven, a joy, a place you can always return home with these buddies you've come through. It should be a happy place. That can be harnessed. <laughs> I mean, is so? if, if anything, Greg tries to be too good a coach, to play too tactically. Yeah, I mean, there, there's an American have inferiority they... we have where we can't just play international football. We have to play dazzling football. The Brazilian World Cup uh, coach was it in 2002 because so, uh, they had to play beautiful football, um, not pragmatic football. And he complained 
why do the Brazilians have to play beautifully and the other teams don't? Like his home fans would go mad if they weren't playing kind of samba football. Um, I, we almost have the opposite problem. I'd almost like to say we don't need to try and play, you know, uh, a club tactically advanced um, kind of Jurgen Klopp, Pep Guardiola inspired football. Let's just play to our strengths and have great spirit. That team I'd love. Um, so we almost don't need a great coach is what I'm trying to say, Matt. We just need one that can let these guys find the right system for these guys rather than to try and force these guys into a system which you could make the case, we've seen a lot of it now, is not quite getting them to where they need to be. Raj, I totally agree, but do you think these players still respect this manager? I'm not in that locker room. I am not in that locker room. I can no. tell you the players I speak to are grateful to him because in in tough times for them, um, you know, in the, there's a, look at this wave. This wave went into Europe. They all surged. We were buzzing. Uh, probably the apogee, um, the, just the high watermark was when Brendan Aronson scored um, against Chelsea for Leeds, that late goal. Um, and it was wonderful. And we felt great. You know, Tyler was there. Um, uh, Weston was coming. Um, Jesse Marsh was was there and it just felt we all felt alive and there were just so many players soaring in Europe and it felt I mean we were just all making depth charts of our US squad who could beat us nobody we still are but, I feel but sorry for is, our opponents they're gonna have to system, face us geo cooking I, I, I mean it's just like I agree but out. does his system fit this these players uh, but the, what happened was that the you know club form dips. Brendan Aronson had a very hard time. Pulisic had a very hard time. Um, you know, Weston had a very hard time. And I think Greg. So if you speak to the players, they'll say Greg was there for us in very very hard times. Uh, I think he's a very loyal. I think he's a very emotional. I think he was a player. He was a player in Europe. Greg yeah. played. I, I'm telling you what I hear. I, you, I'm being sincere. No, um, I, 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 th I think the play, saying, when you speak I'm to the players, he understands. Matt, like what? Matt, Matt, what, Matt, what Matt, just, let, 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 let me finish, is. Matt. I, you asked me what the players think. I can tell you what I've heard is that the players think this is a guy that has gone to Europe and, and had great moments and struggled, and he understands our great moments and he understands how we struggle. I think they're very grateful for that. Um, and that's what I hear. And then the rest is what you're seeing. Um, and it is, it's about system. Definitely. I mean, we are at a moment where it does feel like system over, over getting the best out of these gents. Um, but do you have a suggestion for how you'd like to fix it? Beautiful. I, I wish we had a, a billion dollars to hire someone else, but so let me, let me just ask you this. Is this your coach for the world cup? Um, bad news, Matt. It's not up to me, baby. Um, <laughs> as, 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 like, I believe that uh, Greg Berhalter, I, I'm not sure what you're asking me. Like, Are you asking me, will the Greg still Cup. be the coach? Uh, I mean, there's a massive obstacle in front of him, uh, which is the Copa. Um, and if, if Greg Berhalter gets us out of the group stage in the Copa, um, I believe he will be the coach for the, the World Cup. That's what I can tell well, you. Um, and Thanks, we're Raj. there, I um, Matt. I will say, I got, I dig that. I think the commonest texts I got tonight looking at my texts were, uh, if Hamir Hammergrissen was coach of the US team, how would we be? And genuinely, I mean, that is woof, that that kind of did blow my mind. It is hilarious. Again, if I ran an MLS team, I get double H in in a heartbeat. Matt can be with us Sunday, take a couple more. The mighty James Judkins, come on up, a mute. And tell us where you are and what's your question. How you doing, Double J? Raj, hey, how's it going? J you've got, got a voice for radio, Double J. Where are you, baby? Oh, appreciate it. I'm from Dallas, Texas. Oh, uh, my I God. Why didn't you go to game, James? It's all your fault. It was raining tonight. I'm going to the game on Sunday. I was I was anticipating <laughs> them being at the final. <laughs> I love um, that. Concept. Also, a fellow blue. So up the toffees. Just had to mention that. Mate, you almost had um, tickets for Jamaica against Panama. Oh, I you know that that was running through my mind the entire game. But I actually, I, you know, I have a little different question for you. And sure. and and I didn't think I was going to ask this. Being as much of a Burr halter out as any U.S. fan. Um. Is there is there room for some positivity 
here. I mean, look at the stats. We had 25 shots to six, seven shots on target to three, 88% pass accuracy, 78% possession. You know, the U.S. did a lot right tonight, and I know that a lot of that came out at the end of the game, but, you, you know, we played well. This Jamaican team is better than I think a lot of U.S. fans are really giving them credit for. What's your take on that? Do you think that there is some some optimism to come from this, especially going into the final? Yeah, it's, I mean, I love your approach. Thank you, uh, Double J. I mean, I do think this Jamaican team are a team on the ups. I mean, I, I found the conversation with Haymeer to be quite challenging because I, I mean, you look at the Jamaican diaspora um, and the footballers that they can recruit. And when Haymeer said in the conversation, uh, we have zero staff trying to actively recruit um, dual nationals, he said, I have to do it all myself. Just the, the woeful... Uh, infrastructure and when you speak to a lot of Jamaican players and a lot of ex-Jamaican players they'll echo this uh, just how much raw talent there is how almost negligently um, conquer the Jamaican Federation is and that's something that um, I mean perhaps ahead of the next game we can actually have someone on um, and really talk about that because I think it's a it's a real con it, you know it, at the end of Chinatown it's Chinatown uh, Jake, it's Concacaf. The Jamaican <laughs> story is just like it's Concacaf. Um, they should, yeah. they are, they are getting better. They should be so much better. Um, the fact that so many of the big players are just finding. And Hamir talked about this. The culture shock. These Mikel Antonio, for instance, has when he goes from West Ham mm -hmm. uh, to the locker room. Um, I think Lim Bailey even said it. You go, there's one shirt. It's often a woman's shirt, and they're just like, put it on, come and train. And you're like, what? I mean, yeah. th th despite that, yes, they were very good. So your question's a beautiful one. I'm very grateful for it. Um, Greg in his press conference said, these games aren't always pretty. You don't always play your best, but champions find a way to win. You can see this team hasn't played together for four months. That's pretty clear. Look, um, if you frame it like that, I guess that's your most optimistic take. Um, this team struggles against a low block. Haymeer played a almost, almost perfect agony that it was a self-inflicted wound at the last kick of the ball. It would be a very different story. We wouldn't be taking this. Um, we wouldn't be taking this silver uh, lining from it. Um, and yes, they didn't give up. Yes, they continue to fight. Um, I, I would say, you know, the, the, the Jamaicans tired. In those situations, you need to move the ball quickly from side to side. We, we're a very vertical team. Um, and just the joy that Gio played with uh, as he took over the game as the Jamaicans tired did make you wonder why they were not able to find passes like that, cleverer passes, um, you know, to prepare for. This is the game yeah. they knew they were going to have. This was a battle they knew they were going to have. And I, I can't help think, but we got, we bloody got away with one tonight. And my God, I'm so bloody yeah. glad we did it. It would be so depressing to do it, to do it, do it live after we won that third, fourth game in the Nations League um, on Sunday night. That would be that would be a tough one. James Judkins, can I get a prediction for the final? Are you feel what are you what are you who are you going with? Tell me your vibes. How excited are you for the whole thing? Oh, I am ecstatic! I can't wait. This is um, this is my. Third U.S. match, so I'm I'm expecting. You know what? We're gonna go three to USA over Mexico. I love you. I love because... you. I love you. I, can I just tell you, James? Your spirit, your energy. Um, I don't know what you do professionally. I don't know, like your your love of football. Did you say? Were you the person who said they were also an Everton fan? That was at the previous call. Yes. Yes. No. I'm I I big then, time Everton fan. I love you. Then you know you make the best out of the meager scraps and you turn them into meals. And I, I think you oh, are Raj. Taking, you're taking that approach, James Jenkins, to the U.S. team, aren't you? Oh, uh, Raj! Look at the look at the XG versus what we were facing. That's what Everton's <laughs> been doing all year. We're used to it. We're used to it. Come on, Double J, you've made my night, baby. Come on, be with us. Enjoy um, on Sunday night and call in on your way home. Hopefully, in a moment of victory, you're a magnificent human being. To wrap us up, oh, because Mexico Panama has just kicked off. It's nil nil after six minutes, and I want to go and watch the the game. Come on up. It's Olivia Ward. Bringing us home, Olivia. 
Tell us where you are. Hi, Rod. Right. Uh, I have got a simple soccer question. Where are you, and Olivia? Uh, I'm in you. Memphis. Oh clearly from the accent. God, I, <laughs> you know what? I long to go to Memphis. I really, really uh, do. Best food city in the world. Oh, Tim Howard football teams too. Absolutely, yes. You've got it all. Uh, Olivia, I will come. We will we will raise a glass, <laughs> please, God. That is one of my, I'd say, top five dream American cities for 2024. I will show you the best barbecue in Memphis, Raj. You had me at barbecue, Olivia Ward. <laughs> I'm a very basic human being. Um, what's your question? Uh, so first question is a simple soccer question. Second question is a fashion question. Uh, simple soccer question. Pulisic should only play on the right, right? And fashion question, we'd be playing better if our shirts had collars. Oh, God, just finish your theory, Olivia Ward. I, I genuinely am <laughs> quite fascinated. There's a, there's, um, there's a GFOP Patricia Lee who I adore, who whenever Pep uh, wears a new outfit, sends us a very detailed email where she sleuths it, tells me what fabric it's made of. Uh, where I can get it, what incredibly startling price point it actually sells for. Um, and so I, I find the, the correlation, the tactical correlation between fashion and football is something that we take very seriously on this show. But tell me the thinking on the collars. You think about, is it like if you lose a little toe, apparently it's very hard to stand up for long stretches because that tiny little thing is critical for balance. So you're telling me, Sean, of collars, the shirts just throw the players off. Well, I really feel like as Americans, when we are doing those goal <laughs> celebrations, we should really be popping some collars as we're sliding in. I love a collar. I do love a collar on a football shirt. I love, I mean, you look at the NASL days, like real collars. I mean, like real heft. I mean, I mean, you think, um, is it the Aston Villa team who complained that uh, the Castori kits just don't drain sweat? So they're running around with like 20 pounds extra during <laughs> games. And I'm like, lads, if you were, you know, the collars probably do actually, they're probably deeply unaerodynamic. It's the slim margins that lead to victory in elite football. But I don't care because how great you look when, you know, Jack Grealish, for instance, pops the collar. I, I've got to tell you, I think it's one of the great intangibles. And I need to look, I need to dive into the data. I'm going to get Paul Carr. Um, Paul Carr, by the way, who lost his father this week. I just want to, if you're watching, Paul, you beautiful human being, you stats wonder. Just wish you a long life. I hope your dad's uh, life is a great memory for you, you great American. But I'm going to have Paul Carr run the rule statistically uh, on the great collar intangible. But your other question, Olivia Ward, one was about the collars, and I'm going to dig deeper and report back. What was the first one? I'm sorry, I'm a bit dim tonight, and I've forgotten. <laughs> Pulisic always plays oh better on the God. right. That's, With, where, that's where he has to start. That's where you have to play. I mean, it's a weird thing. This is ultimately Olivia Ward. Thank you for bringing us home in such a fine way. I adore you because you've like come with a very intelligent question about football and collars, uh, which is like serious heft. And then you've asked us a flippant one, uh, which reaches into the essence of international football. Um, and the essence of international football, and this goes back to the first question, was it from Chris Ferris or was it from Matt? Um, it's ultimately international football is a strange beast and you can do one of two things as a manager. You can either um, try and play the best system and fit the best players into the system that you believe will bring your nation glory, which is kind of what that's really been the essence of Greg Ball. Um, but many, many international managers, you know, Greg in his after speech, I'll read it again. Uh, he said, you can see this team hasn't played together for four months. That's pretty clear. That's called international football. They don't bloody play together that often. That is international football. That's the essence of it. It's an, a game, essentially an all-star game, where the teams are flung together for minutes. They train maybe once or twice. Um, they play fleetingly. They're fleeting creatures. And every international manager you speak to is faced, you know, do I just create a system, try and plug my players in, or do I try and just play with my best players and create a system that coheres around me trying to get the best out of them? Um, so Heymeyer is, is like, he's always the latter. He's like, I've got one good player up top. I'm going to work out who can get the ball to that person and everybody else is going to hunker down. Um, 
And ultimately, right now, you know, where is Christian's best position? We could do a huge show on just that one question. But in Milan, where Christian is having the most sustained um, European club football success in his whole career with fans, that's what's happened this season. He's found his joy again. He's found his centrality. He's found his meaning. He's found his essence. He's found his clinicality. He's scoring big goals and big games. Where's he playing? He's playing on the right. Um, yes. So ultimately, you know, this is international football. How do you bring the best out of your players? That's ultimately, I think that you've actually nailed um, Olivia Ward, the essence of the dilemma that Greg's facing. And same, by the way, with Balogun. Like with Judge Balogun, there's a lot of people saying, oh, we, we pine for Balogun. Uh, we yearn for Balogun. He committed to us. He's, you know, he's struggling. The honest truth is, how does Balogun play football? How does Balogun score goals? You can't just play him and say, this is your, now your system. Uh, you have to somewhat play to his strengths. To me, Pepe was always the guy. And Pepe didn't score tonight. Pepe had a very, very good game. Um, oh, Pepe... he was so close. He was so close. He was he... right there. I was and feeling created... it. His runs, his moves. He created a, you know, he created a... He was the first player to come on and create a question mark in the Jamaican backline. Um, so ultimately, to me, Pepe was the gentleman. Um, but again, these are the decisions. Are we trying to play? Uh, are we trying to play to our player strengths? Are we trying to fit them into our system? And I think ultimately, that's the thing. Um, that's the thing that we're caught between. Um, please, God, it will change. Olivia, I've loved chatting to you. I've loved chatting to everybody tonight. Come be with us. Um, on Sunday um, after the game. Um, I just want to read again what Anthony Robinson said about this Nations League. This kind of reflects the the good of this US team. Um, and I hope this is the mantra of which we attack there. We've almost, we, we've almost phoned a friend tonight. We've got out of jail free. I think I've just mixed two. Monopoly and what was the other one that I've just mixed? Who cares? Um, we are going to be in Sunday's final. It's a new game, a new life, a new wonder. Anthony Robinson, I want us to win this league to the point it gets boring to people that we keep winning it, which is an astonishing thing to say on many levels. I, f I love Anthony Robinson. I adore him. Uh, we get a chance to do that again Sunday night. The three-peat um, is still on. We will break it down. Um, I just want to ultimately, we won. We live. We have joy. We get to share another 90 minutes together on um on Sunday night of relevant, meaningful United States football. I will never take that for granted. I cannot wait. Um, and I'll just say quickly, here's a look at everything we've got coming up before the final uh, on the Men in Blazers media network. All of it brought to you by, oh, Michelob Ultra, best Mickey, since Arteta, superior light beer. In a matter of mere hours, I'm going to be back up. I'm going to be writing my newsletter, writing a newsletter that will break this game down. Uh, be into your inboxes early in the morning. Subscribe at our website, meninblazers.com. Uh, as soon as that takes flight, I'm going to tape with Jesse Marsh, who I actually love speaking to about the United States team. We're going to break it all down, uh, what we experienced and survived tonight. It will hit our pod feed as soon as we can flip it right around tomorrow. Sunday night, Nations League final. Uh, we'll be back with my friend, Brendan Hunt, Coach Beard of Ted Lasso, and we'll break it all down together uh, with you. You can come up, hang out with us. Um, three peat, baby. Just keep saying it to yourself. We will make it real together. Um, save your football. I do feel um, to watch this US team, the men, the women, we should never take it for granted. Um, bring on the final, bring on the Copa, uh, bring on the Olympics. Uh, whatever happens, let's just make memories together and savor every second. This is Rog. I've loved being with you, saying huge love. I'll speak to you tomorrow. Courage. Go, go, USA.